First off, a follow-up to yesterday's episode where I told a couple stories about Hood River. One in particular, I described something I saw twice while I was walking through the city at night. I always chalked it up to 50% hallucination, maybe 50% coyote. But you, my dear listeners, pointed out what it really was. And then we take a look at the first time that the world of fetishes, law enforcement, and the internet collided today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having... For the sake of the intro, I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. My day hasn't been that good. It's... It's been... Okay, so I don't know how many of you guys out there have had anxiety attacks. I think like one third of people have suffered from them. And if you don't know what... I've been having them since I was 12. If you don't know what they are, they're quite uh, terrifying. You think you're dying. I've been having them since I was 12. It's just something that I get... So I kind of know what's going on, but let me kind of take you through pretty much what, what I'm going mentally through right now, what I've been going through for maybe about the past hour. I'm recording this episode much later than I normally do. So I woke up this morning about 7 a.m., and I'm making, <laughs> I'm making breath fix, and I start lifting weights. I've been lifting weights for a while now, and I was got really aggressive with it today. I mean, this isn't to brag, because I know a lot of you guys don't think this is even that much, but I'm hammer curling 25 pounds with the 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 barbells, the hand the hand ones, the ones you just hold in your hand, as opposed to the ones you levitate with your mind. I think the long one is actually the barbell, so the dumbbells are the little ones. 25 on each of those, standing up, doing hammer curls at the same time. So basically, I'm throwing 50 pounds on my body. I'm picking them up off the ground, doing eight reps, putting them back down, going to check on my breath fix. That's cooking. Come back, do that. About 30 seconds of rest in between three sets of that. You're thinking, Jason, that's not a lot. And it's not. It's not a lot, actually. And then I do probably about 30 push-ups, which were door push-ups. Don't be impressed. I'm an old man, and I'm overweight. Any exercise is good exercise. And then I was doing some good mornings. And then I was just doing some regular bicep curls with 20-pound weights. Then I am hanging out with my friends, and they have their lacrosse gear. And I was like, hey, man, can I see your stick? Can I see your lacrosse stick? I've never used one of these before. So I take the lacrosse stick and I go, give me, give me one of your balls. And he hesitates and I go, man, I got enough money to buy a hundred balls. So he gave me the ball. And then I'm throwing, for the first time ever, I'm, I'm using this lacrosse stick to throw. They showed me how to do it, to throw the ball as far as I can. And I can feel it. I can feel it. I mean to say in my arm and through my chest. And I'm like, whoa, this is really good. Like exercise. Like I can actually feel all my muscles activating. On the left side of my chest, they said, yeah, it's really aggressive. Just wait till you start running and trying to, like, actually play rather than just throw the ball. And then I go grocery shopping, and I bought probably about, I don't know, 10 pounds of groceries, and I put it all in just one bag. I'm like, "Ah, I can do it. And I'm walking down the street, and I just carry it in one bag on my left arm. So I'm using the cross thing, and I'm mostly using my left arm. I used my left arm when I was lifting the weights. I'm carrying a bag of about 10 pounds of groceries about a mile and a half from the grocery store to my home. I get home, and I start going, oh my god, oh my god, my chest hurts, oh my god, I'm having a heart attack, Jason, calm down, you're not having a heart attack yet, oh my god, this might be it, I'm coming home, Martha, I'm coming home, and for basically the past hour and a half, I've been having to try to calm myself down, because my anxiety attack is saying, you're having a heart attack right now, you need to call the doctor right now, you need to go, feel that chest pain? You feel the pain in your, uh uh-oh, your neck's starting to get sore too, isn't it? Oh, you're getting a little squeam. You call the doctor. You're having a heart attack, bro. You're having a heart attack. Take care of this. And my rational mind is saying, I know this is taking a little bit longer than most of my intros, but I think this is good for people who are dealing with, with anxiety attacks. Or maybe it's just good for me to get it off my chest. My rational mind is saying, dude, you're 42 years old. You were lifting a ton of weights today, more than you normally do. You stepped it up today. You were playing with the the sport equipment that you've never used before, and you could tell that it was hurting. You carried all this stuff on top of all the physical labor you do throughout the day for your job. You're not having a heart attack. You have several pulled muscles in your body. Stretch next time. 
And despite that, that knowledge, and despite the fact that I'm healthier now than I've been in 20 years because of my weight loss, I still have to walk around the block. You know what's one of the, the key things, one of the key tools, and this and I'll end this because I know this probably isn't super interesting, but one of the key tools I've used for my anxiety attacks is basically an anxiety attack is your brain activating your fight or flight mechanism. So as far as your brain knows, there's a saber-toothed tiger sneaking up behind you. And it, your body is telling you to run, 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 run. Fight or flight. There's nothing to fight because nothing exists there. So your body's basically pumping all this adrenaline. I used to try to distract myself. I'd throw in the office. And then that would be the episode where like somebody dies or they make a joke about that. You know, I'm like, oh my God. But I would watch like a show. I would try to watch a fun show or something I really liked. And I really always had a hard time but yeah, so what, what my coping mechanism is for anxiety attacks now, instead of trying to distract myself from the fight or flight mechanism, I basically throw myself into the fight mode. I'll pretend that like, in my mind, I'm boxing someone in the street, or aliens are attacking and I have to figure out a way to, to destroy them, not to run away. I have to fight, fight them. I have to imagine myself like taking one of their guns and blowing them away. Fighting terrorists, ninjas, whatever. Like, I throw my brain into the fight. And that actual that distracts me from the anxiety attack. Everything else that I'm trying to like calm down doesn't work. But I'll just picture like a bear breaking into my apartment and I'm just like wrestling the bear, fighting the bear. I always win, and that actually seems to help. But if you're dealing with anxiety attacks, I mean statistically one third of you guys are, that try that method. Some people say if you rub your hands together, it can um it activates both sides of your brain. They start talking to each other so the logical and the I don't know if there's an illogical part of your brain, but the two parts of your brain start talking to each other. That could be that. But there's all sorts of different coping mechanisms. You know what? To be honest, this anxiety attack was really getting me worked up. I live in Hood River. There's bars everywhere. I thought, I should just go get a shot of vodka. That would calm me down. And I thought it would. But that is the cure of being worse than the disease. It would. And then in six months, that would be your go-to answer is a shot of vodka or more. So, didn't do that. But yeah, anxiety attacks suck because they really kind of suck all of the um, energy out of you. I I was like, I don't even want to record an episode tonight. And I am. And it's this. So, let's go ahead and get started with the episode. That went on a little bit longer than I wanted it to. But um, let's just go with it. Because I think it's good for people who are suffering from that. And if you're not, if you've never had an anxiety attack, now you kind of have an idea what it's like. If you ever walk down the street and you see a guy going, choo, 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 take that, Zaps Lork, evil dominion king of the reptilians, then you go, oh, he's just having an anxiety attack. And he listens to Dead Rabbit Radio. Let's go ahead and move on to, oh, well, the first story actually is really interesting because it's not so much a story as it is a follow-up. And let me say this real quick so not everyone listens to every episode. Yesterday's episode, I talked about all the creepy stuff of Hood River. And trust me, I barely scraped the surface. I edited out like 10 minutes of it because I went on this weird political rant. And I couldn't cut around it. So I had to take 10 minutes of mood setting right out of it. Which is fine. The episode was long anyways. But Hood River is just a very, very kind of weird town. During the day, it's a tourist town. It looks beautiful. Beautiful people walking around. At night, it completely flip-flops. Where it's completely dead. Uh, most of the, the the town is almost completely deserted by 10 p.m. You can walk down it. I one day I walked through Hood River for from the heights down into Hood River for probably about a half hour and didn't see another human at all. So it's really once the sun goes down, basically this town shuts down. There's three Masonic lodges within maybe two city blocks of each other. There's a t- population of 10,000 people and there's probably. Eight to ten churches, which is a lot for such a small population. It really is. I mean, you figure not each, n- not everyone goes to church, and some of the churches are like the Mormon Church, and then there's like a Seventh Day Adventist Church, and then there's Jehovah's Witness Temple. And I'm like, and how many of these people are there actually here? So always a sign that there's something. When you go to a place and it, there's a lot of churches, it means everyone is trying to redeem themselves from something that's going on. They feel guilty. So they build a church. You know, generally churches are proportional to the population they serve if you find a lot of churches in a certain area. It may mean something's up, but this town's definitely creepy. And I I talked about when I was walking through Hood River one night, it was like four in the morning. I was walking down State Street, which one of the main streets that cut through. I was all by myself. And what I saw in front of me, 
I just saw the hindquarters. It was a lanky, white, hairless creature. Now, from... It was walking like... I actually put a video on YouTube of somebody walking like I described. It's basically if someone was walking on all fours. So, you know how your butt is higher than your hands when you're walking? That's what this looked like. So, I, I see this thing walk, and I see like it's butt up in the air, and these long, white, hairless legs. And then I saw the body kind of aiming downwards like someone is walking on all fours, and I don't see the front of it. And it's easily, its butt is probably up to uh, around my chest. So I figured it was, I would, well, maybe not my chest, maybe like my stomach. It was about three feet tall. It was almost as tall as the trunk of the car it was walking behind. And I went around the car and I looked and I, it wasn't there. It was completely gone. And I had no idea what it was. I figured it was some sort of hairless creature, but at the time I thought maybe I'm just hallucinating. And then a couple weeks later, I was walking in another place in Hood River, and I saw it charge me from down the, probably about 100 yards away, I think is what I said it was. It's charging me, and then when it gets to the foot of the stairs where I'm at, by the time I look down the stairs, it's completely gone. So this thing can vanish, it can move very, very fast. And I talked about this on my episode, sorry for that quick overview for the people who did listen to it, but... So I posted that up, and I just figured, there's just some weird thing that I saw. Today I got a comment on YouTube from Fate is Fallen, and he goes, oh, yeah, I know what that is. It's a crawler. What he describes is called a crawler. He goes, not only do, not only is there a name for these things, there's a subreddit, r slash crawler sightings. It's like, what? No way. Seriously? I said all those things as I was looking at my comments on YouTube. So I went to r slash crawler crawler sightings the very first thing that pops up is a this guy goes you think these crawlers are hairless creatures and the very first thing that popped up he had a photo of a hairless sunny bear which is some sort of bear from asia and i go that's it that's exactly what it looked like it wasn't a hairless sunny bear I thought it was interesting that, and scary, that the descriptions other people had been giving of their sightings of these things, someone else was able to find a photo and goes, does this kind of look like it? And that is almost identical. The butt was higher because it was proportioned differently. But the way the skin hung, the way I was describing it yesterday, how it kind of hung and folds, that's what this looked like. And apparently these things are spotted, they're they're spotted a lot in the United States. They have some some sightings in other countries. On a thread in the subreddit, they go, I'm new to this site, can you guys tell me anything about these? There's not like, a lot of times on subreddits, they'll have, I know most of my 4chan audience is pulling their hair right out (laughs) right now that I have to talk about all this stuff, but a lot of times on good subreddits at least, they'll have a sidebar that kind of has general information, so you can kind of jump right into it. You read the sidebar and it goes, This is what it is, and this is the rules, and this is what we're looking at. But I didn't see one for this. I don't see them on a lot of subreddits, actually. But there was this post on this thread that said, Crawlers are the genre of cryptid consisting of tall, white, lanky humanoids that people observe in various places. From what I think the person who posted this was Victor Shivo, I believe was the name. From what I can tell, a lot of sightings occur in the northern United States, which is Hood River. And by the edges of woodland areas. Most occur at nighttime as well. And it's funny because one of my listeners, Rabbit Fish, was actually dry. And I mentioned him before. I've mentioned him a couple times. When he was driving through, I might have even mentioned this comment. When he was driving through Hood River, he said, it's look, it looks like there was a town and then a forest blew up right in the middle of it. Like there's just trees and weird spots all over. Basically, the, the town is a woodland area with a bunch of shops, a bunch of places there. And it goes, there are a few creatures people include in the crawler category, including the Wendigo, the Skinwalker, the Fleshgate, and of course, just the generic crawler. Now, I've heard of all of those. The Wendigo, the Skinwalker. Skinwalker is incredibly popular on 4chan. I think they really turned it into a meme. When I was a kid, Skinwalker was just a like a term for a Native American spirit. And now it's become like this, it's its own cryptid. And we may do a whole episode on, on skinwalkers. I always consider them just a meme, just some creepy pasta. But if I saw one and didn't know these things, again, see, here's the thing. Like, I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my life. 
And I, I'm not like an indigo child. I'm not like, I'm in touch with the universe. Like, I'm not like that type of guy. When I see something weird, the first thing I go is, I must be hallucinating. Like, I must have, I, either I hallucinated, it was a trick of the light, my imagination got too much of me, or all, all, all of those put together. All of those put together. I don't immediately go, oh my God, a portal has been ripped through time and this thing is just, I, that's just not the way that I think. Now, it's funny because I'll see, that may be a coping mechanism because I'll see something and I don't immediately get panicked. And because I think part of me is going, that's not real. That's obviously not real what I'm looking at. And then as time goes on, I'm like, oh my God, what did I almost run into? That I have no explanation for that. And that creature, I always considered something that I just, I, 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 I thought it had to have been some sort of wild animal that somehow was super huge and it crawled under a car and I was never able to see it. And then a couple weeks later, it charged me. And then it must have veered away real quick in the moment for me to look down. And it just wily coyote out of there. A little smoke trail. Like, I must have missed something. That's how I always viewed that thing. But now I'm seeing that there may be more of these out here. There's a chart where they're tallying all the reported sightings of these crawlers. I'm going to add Hood River to that chart. Or at least ask. I'm going to say, I'm not just going to draw it on there. I'll be like, hey guys, I'd like to put this on here. Because I think that that definitely is what it is. Now, they, they, a lot of people say they see the front of it and has really long, like, fingernails and spooky shark teeth. And I don't know. I didn't see any of that stuff. But it, it, to me, the arms looked a bit shorter because of the way it was walking, but it was running quite fast. You know what? And that you, so there is a YouTube video on my playlist. It's called, Carla the Creeper or something like that. I wish I should have the name. But anyways, it's on there. It's on my YouTube playlist under Dead Rabbit Radio Clips. You'll just see this out of... That shows you how fast someone can run when they're walking on their hands. When they're walking for on, on all fours. It's really weird to have a sighting with no knowledge of something. And then re- someone sends you a picture of it. Someone sends you a go, oh no, what you saw, that's totally like, a, a, it's not common, but a lot of people have seen those things. So thank you, fate is fallen. And then we'll go into this, because in I, I didn't have time to do all this research, but Barfy Man, Barfy Man said, oh, the rake. You saw the rake, which is a very popular, again, creepypasta thing that I always attributed to just the spooky story. But even on this Reddit thread... People are saying, yeah, it's the rake. The, the crawler and the rake are the same thing. So we'll go more into the rake. We'll investigate this cryptid a little bit more. But it is possible that it's very likely that what I saw was an actual thing that not only is very real, but others have seen it. And if you're not careful, you may see it too. So let's go ahead and move on to this last story here. Now, this last story I think is interesting because. It really was the first time we saw a bunch of things collide. The year is 1996. It's October 16th. And out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of BFE America, there's a man and a woman engaging in consensual sex. His name is Robert Glass. And he spent the last few days torturing Sharon Lopatka consensually. And at the very end, he wraps a rope around her neck and is tightening it. And she's telling him, kill me, kill me, kill me. Sharon Lopatka was a married woman. She had kids. And we're back in 1996. And really, for a lot of my audience, I know was really younger. That, I mean, the internet was an amazing place back then. It's amazing now, the, 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 just the access that you have to information. But back then, there was something magical about it. Anyone can make their bones on the internet. So, you have this wife, you have this mother. She runs an internet marketing firm. Because anybody could do it back then. She wrote ad copy, and what she would do is she'd basically make the little boxes. She knew how to work the computer, do the HTML and GIFs and all that stuff, JPEGs. She would make those little rectangular boxes that would be at the bottom of all these websites. She would go to people and say, I will make you an ad for this for 50 bucks each. 
And people were like, you're a magician. You can make an image and put it on the web. You're, oh my God, you're amazing. Again, see, all of that stuff is automated now. But back then, it was just this magical time. She did it for all sorts of businesses. She had like brochures to like for home decor. She did ones for psychic phone hotlines. I got a psychic phone hotline story. I'll tell that someday. I'll have to remember that. She also used them to market pornography. And it was specifically pornography that featured hypnotized or chloroformed women being assaulted against their will. She was really into that. She began, first she starts selling the ad copy, but then she starts involving herself in the websites. She starts posting under these aliases. She has all these different characters she's created who she is talking to online. So she's writing stories, she's on the forum, but then she also has all these different characters she's created. She's talking to different men around the world, these fetishes she has. Now, she would talk about really, really extreme stuff. So it wasn't, I mean, chloroforming and hypnotizing and drugging women, that is all falls under the veil of rape, rape fantasy. But she went past that. Her fantasy was to be tortured and killed. It wasn't a BDSM thing where she would simply be tortured and then the master would be like, have you had enough? And she'd be like, yes, yes. And then he unchains her and then, and then like they sit and drink a couple Bud Lights and we'll play Mario Kart. Like, that isn't what she wanted. She actually wanted to be tortured and killed. That was her ultimate sexual fantasy. And it was to a point she would talk about this so much online that a professional sex worker, a hooker, saw one of these posts and actually began communicating with her and saying, don't do this. Like, you're going to take this too far. She could tell that there was something in the writings that said that she really wanted to do this. And Sharon's response was, I really want this to happen to me. Go away. I don't want to talk to you anymore. This is what I really want to happen. Now, of course, there are going to be a lot of takers out there. A lot of people who are already into, not of course, like that's totally common, but if you're already on one of these extreme fetish sites, a lot of people are going to be into it. But the thing is, is like after after the fantasy's over, after they go after basically they're done masturbating, they come to their senses and go, oh, that's a terrible idea. And then they stop communicating with the person. And then a couple of days of guilt go on and they'll come back. But most people just see it as a fantasy. But Robert Glass was a little different. He was a computer analyst. And he was doing the same thing where he was trolling these fetish sites. But him and Sharon hadn't crossed paths yet. But his wife found some stuff on his computer that she described as raw and disturbing and violent. So she leaves him. Now, he's home alone, and this is the point where he meets Sharon. So now he, he's completely single, just sitting in front of his computer all day long, interacting with Sharon. On October 13th, Sharon tells her husband, you know, I'm going to go visit some friends. I'm going to go visit some friends. And he's like, okay, you know, doesn't really think anything of it. His wife packs up and leaves. But after she leaves, he finds a note. And she's saying she'll never come back to him. And in the note it says, If my body is never retrieved, don't worry. Know that I am at peace. So her husband's obviously very concerned. He calls the police. And this is known as the very first time that the police had to like use the internet, like get into email servers and things like that to solve a crime. This is the very first time this ever happened was in 1996. We People were still using fax machines. A lot of places were still using carbon copy. I, I've worked at, like when I worked at Best Buy, we still used green screen computers. And that was like in 99, 2000. We, technology is very, very slow to move in the government and in corporate sector. So there's the police are like, oh, great, electronic mail. How are we supposed to do this? Okay, everyone, get your dial-up modems and let's go on to AOL. I mean, like, completely outside the box for the police. But they have to do this because they have no idea where she went. The only thing the husband can say is she was on the computer all the time. So the cops have to get into her computer and just basically click on stuff. They, it, the investigative techniques were not there yet. They're like, well, did she get a virus? <laughs> did she get sucked into the computer via lawnmower man? We don't know. But what they do is they kind of start, they're not, they're not cavemen. They didn't bash the computer open with a rock and look for her. But the, you, where do you, you basically have a piece of technology 
that may or may not be linked to a missing person, where do you start looking? You start looking in Word documents to see like draft letters of the suicide note or whatever it was. Nowadays, when someone goes missing, the first thing you start looking at is phones and emails and stuff like that. But back then, this is the very first time. So she was in Maryland. Robert Glass was in North Carolina. I didn't, I never really said where this stuff was going on, but I don't really, it's the internet, so I don't really know how, how much that matters. But anyways, it is interstate. So the cops begin basically going through her computer, and that is where they come across 900 emails exchanged between Robert Glass and Sharon Lopatka. Now, here's the thing. She communicated with tons of people. So it's not like they immediately just go, oh, look at 900 inbox for this one particular person. They have to go through all this stuff. But they quickly zero in on him because the, the like the violence and the cruelty and how recent those emails are. Those emails are talking about how much she wants to be tortured and killed. And they're basically going up to shortly before the day she disappeared. The police go to Glass's house. They're able to track him down. They know who he is now. People weren't big on aliases back then, I guess. I guess even, well, I guess he had to send her his address. But they do have his address, and they go there. They find child pornography. They find a 357 Magnum. They find drugs. They find bondage equipment in his house. And about 75 yards from his house, they see some freshly disturbed soil. Cops go out there. Start digging it up. They had a search warrant for all this, by the way. They just didn't show up. He was at work when they showed up, apparently. Which I don't know how the search warrant works on that, but maybe if it's a murder, they 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 just have to have the warrant. They go, they dig it up, they find body parts in there. So they arrest him. They arrest Robert Glass. And what's interesting is he says it was an accident. That's that's not the interesting part. But he was saying that listen, she came over to my house. She really wanted me to kill her. We were, she was totally down for the torture. I was down for the torture. We were down for the sex. And she really wanted me to kill her. But in the end, I didn't want to kill her. I didn't know how tight I was making the rope. And I killed her. Which means it probably wasn't like a long... Because there's two different ways to strangle someone. You can compress the uh, carotid arteries long enough to stop blood flow to the brain. And causing a brain death. That takes a while. Or you can, or just by choking someone, you can crack the bone in their throat. And that will kill them. They'll suffocate. So the long way to cut off, like when you can put someone in a choke hold or a sleeper hold, you're cutting off blood flow to the brain. But if you do it wrong, you can actually break the little bone in your neck and you suffocate. I actually don't think you can hold someone's neck until they stop breathing unless you break that bone. I think you're always cutting the blood flow off to their brain. But anyways, he's saying, yes, I put the rope around her neck and I did torture her. It was totally consensual. You guys read the emails. You know she came here for this. However... I was plain, I did not plan on actually killing her. She wanted me to kill her. I did not want to. Something went wrong and she died. The weird part is the coroner, the medical examiner, when he did his autopsy, ruled it as an accidental death. He said this was not a homicide. This woman was accidentally killed. So it's interesting what the medical examiner must have seen because she was strangled with a rope. What the medical examiner must have seen to make him think she was not. And it could have been the little broken piece of wind. It could have been the little broken bone. But who knows? But the the medical examiner for the state ruled, yes, this was an accidental death. So now the the police are like, it's not. (laughs) This this guy killed this woman. It was a murder. It was a homicide. They're like, well, I mean, she did die. But we don't think it was premeditated. Even though they exchanged these emails talking about wanting to die and get tortured and all that stuff, we don't think it was premeditated homicide. This was the first time emails were ever used in an investigation or in a trial. Very, very first time in American history. So you had this brand new technology being used to try to convict this guy. He actually ended up pleading guilty to voluntary manslaughter. Which I basically, I think involuntary manslaughter generally is like drunk driving. Or voluntary manslaughter is, in, from what I understand, I could be wrong on this, is, is willingly engaging in an incredibly risky act that results in somebody dying. So drinking and driving might actually be voluntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter would be like driving a tractor and accidentally driving it over a child. 
and you could say the, the tractor was totally functional. You did something wrong that made you drive over that kid. That's involuntary manslaughter. Voluntary manslaughter, I believe, would be if you were doing stunts and a kid was sitting on the back of your tractor and you were popping wheelies and the kid falls off and gets mangled up. Horrible example. I don't know why I picked that one. But I think that's the difference. And, and I think a lawyer could obviously prove me wrong. But he pleads guilty to voluntary manslaughter. He gets uh, sentenced to 36 to 53 months in the state, which is three to five years, basically. Three to six years, something like that, for the, the killing of this woman. He got an additional 27 months of federal time after that for the child, child pornography possession. He had some magazines. So he has a heart attack the day before his federal sentence is supposed to start. He does do his two to five years in the state, and then before he gets transferred, he has a heart attack and dies. It's interesting. Two interesting things came out when I was researching this story. One, there is a particular fetish called auto-assassinophilia. Auto-assassinophilia, which is, which is sexually aroused by the risk of being killed. We've talked about auto-assassination. That's engaging in risky behavior. We talked about on that with the Smiley Face Killer episode. People, young men drinking and doing stupid stuff is known as auto-assassination. They're basically killing themselves in a risky, doing risky things and dying. Street racing would be auto-assassination. Auto-assassination philia, auto-assassination philia, however, where that was the ultimate pleasure for her. She didn't want it to back down. She wanted to go as far as it, as she could and then die, which seems kind of like a bizarre fetish to have. It's so, like, you never know if it's good because it just ends. I think the reason why I find it fascinating is that crime is such a part of our species. I don't think I could imagine a world without criminals. It would be nice, but even in the most utopian vision in Star Trek, in the world of Star Trek, there is crime. People are still doing things and going to jail. They have jails and Starfleet and all that stuff. Like, an idea of humanity without crime seems so alien, it almost seems dystopian. We, we think of crime as being a downside of free will. If you want to have free will, you have to accept a certain amount of crime in your society. If you had a movie or a story or a book where there was no crime in it, where crime had been completely obliterated, it would seem like a totalitarian society where you had no sense of free will. So when we have these stories of these crimes for the very first time butting up against a brand new technological innovation, I always think that's fascinating. Without the internet, these two people probably never would have crossed paths. Sharon would most likely be a grandmother by now. She would have had this unfulfilled fantasy because the chances of her running into someone like Robert Glass in her small town is infinitesimal. And the chances of Robert Glass running into someone in his small town that wanted to be tortured, infinitesimal. But when we create the internet, for all the good that has come out of it, we allow people with these super dark fantasies to meet across the state, across the globe. They can communicate, they can find each other. In some ways, that may be good. You may feel completely alone and that no one in the world understands you. And when you find a forum of people who share the same interests as you do, you don't feel alone anymore. You finally have a place in the world. But if that forum is a place of people who revel in the destruction of others, the question is, in that situation, are you better off thinking no one else is like you? Are you better off thinking you're a freak and you are alone? You may be lonely, but you'll be alive. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O'Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. But I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Bye.